When? Lily Tomlin said, I always want. And good evening and welcome to Our Planet TV. I'm Randy Moggins, and we are live on the Conscious Consumer Network and streaming from offplanetmedia.net as well. <clears throat> I am suffering the ravages of East Coast allergies tonight, so my voice is, uh, well, it's a little scratchy, but we'll, we'll manage through it anyway. It is uh, July the 15th, 2015. We're uh, airing this, of course, uh, uh, over CCN, which is in Europe, so the folks in Europe are getting this sometime like two o'clock in the morning. But uh, it is uh, still uh, almost barely daylight right now, July 15th here in America. It is day one of Jade Helm 15, the op military operation that we've talked about um, for several months now. And um, <clears throat> as we go to air tonight, I have. Uh, Witnessed uh, photographs taken by some travelers whom I know um, that indicate that Jade Helm is in fact in effect here on the East Coast. I have photos which I have, was not able to get so that I can show them to you, but um, we are seeing highway diversions here on the East Coast, specifically in West Virginia. Uh, brown signs which indicate the Army, uh, military diversion of traffic around major routes, so a couple things to note here as we go through this. This is a military exercise inside the United States. Um, whether it will remain an exercise or it will go live at some point, very difficult to tell. We, we have our suspicions, we have our hopes. But um, one of the things I wanna caution is that if you encounter these operations, uh, use wisdom, um, remain calm, do not engage. If you are engaged, bear in mind that you are being psychologically profiled. Um, one of the things that they are looking for is um, your, your biometric information, your personal information, tracking information, and things like that. This is all part of the Jade Helm exercise. It is an amassment of data aggregated into a uh, military database called Jade 2. And so use wisdom and engaging. Remember that um, there are legal ramifications to this operation. The military does have the right to divert traffic on the interstate highways. Those highways were built specifically for the military during the Eisenhower administration. So they're within their legal rights to do so on interstate highways. Inside the states themselves, it gets shadier. Be aware, again, that um, the military is very serious even when they are engaging in training operations and so you want to remain calm you want to be aware of your rights i would recommend that you go on the internet and search the army publication called the law of war which was published this year in 2015 and also look at the lieber code which is the 1862 document that has never uh by the way expired that was the document used to conduct war during the Civil War. Um, it's a good idea to be aware of your rights, but it's also good to use wisdom. And that's all I'm gonna say on it right now. We're gonna watch this operation over the next few months as it plays out. And we're gonna hope and we're gonna pray that America stays at peace and that our own military is not turned against us. And we will hope that the patriots in this country 
also we'll use caution and wisdom as we go forward. And um, so that, that covers that subject. That was something I wanted to bring up while I had the airwaves tonight. Tonight we're going to look at alternative history. And uh, we like to do this from time to time. Look at things from a different viewpoint than you've been taught because we know that our history has been rewritten many times over the course of the centuries, <clears throat> certainly over the course of the millennia. And um, it's important that uh, we get a grasp and understand the background of our history and our heritage. And um, my first hour guest tonight, who has been very patient with me as we went through enormous technical problems getting to air tonight, is uh, Catherine Children. And she's going to talk about Shakespeare Suppressed. Her website is shakespearesuppressed.com. Our number two tonight will be Gloria Amendola. We're going to talk about Mary Magdalene, the first century avatar. So we're going to look at, um, well, more modern history, certainly from the um, 16th century, but then we're going to go back in time as well. So uh, this is uh, Ladies' Alternative History Night. And we're going to look at history from two different perspectives. And to that end, I want to welcome my first hour guest tonight, Catherine Children. Welcome to Off Planet TV. Thank you so much. It's my great pleasure. It's my pleasure to have you on. We have uh, we have to do a, we have to do a little bit of a prop here. We want to thank our friend Nave Marky Mark, who has asked to be named as such. Uh, he is a knight in the court of service to Off Planet TV and a friend of Catherine's, a friend of mine. And uh, he gets executive producer credit for the show tonight. Marky Mark, the knave out there, hopefully listening. Um, brother, hats off. Or should I say we doff the, uh, what is the appropriate hat wear for the court? Um, bonnet. Thy bonnet. There you go. There you go. We'll doff we the bonnet. Thy bonnet. Yeah, we will. Oh, there we go. Okay, Catherine, it's good to have you on. Um, Shakespeare suppressed. Uh, this is a huge subject. A lot of people would look at this subject and go, well, why does this matter? And um, the answer is that this is part of um, our present day history in a huge way. Um, <clears throat> the bard, Shakespeare, uh, is responsible and attributable to uh, a very pivotal period in the formation of English linguistics, um, English literary culture. Uh, he has given us, um, the, the key here is the big question, and that's what our guest is going to uh, pursue with us. But um, the Bard gave us a wide array of forms of theater that are still with us today from the forces of Midsummer Night's Dream to the courtroom intrigues of King Lear, Henry VIII, um, Macbeth, the sonnets, which are a formation of the modern English poetry. This is a, this is a pivotal form of literature that has great bearing on our own culture today. And so it matters tremendously who this man was and how this uh, huge piece of literary history was formed. Catherine, tell us a little bit about yourself. Tell us how you came to be interested in Shakespeare and how you came to go into the work of writing this, this, this book, Shakespeare Suppressed. Well, first, thank you for that wonderful introduction. I almost had a tear in my eye when you were telling me um, how important Shakespeare is, because a lot of people don't know that, um, how... Uh, he was one of the greatest intellects who ever ever lived, and that we're we're um, speaking his language today. Then we don't even know it. Like I had explained before, um, he he invented uh, about two thousand words and many many well known phrases that we say and we don't know they came from Shakespeare originally. So um, by you highlighting his importance was very dear to me. Thank you. Um, how I got into it, um, I saw a debate on television. Um, between uh, a Shakespeare professor from an Ivy League co college. Um, he was debating a man who was saying that Shakespeare, uh, the, the man that we all believe wrote the works, uh, he was born in Stratford on Avon in 1564. He was saying that he is not the real Shakespeare, that Shakespeare was really someone's pen name and, and for uh, the Earl of Oxford, who was a famous courtier during the period. And I 
Although um, I was a history major at UCLA, I knew nothing of this topic, so I came into it fresh. So I'm pretty unbiased watching. And um, the Shakespeare professor from, you know, a top college, um, he could not defend himself. He could not give us reasons why it was like a fact that the man from Stratford was the great author. Mm -hmm. So, and then the other man, the man who was saying it was really someone's pen name for a nobleman, he kept making fact after fact after fact, making perfect sense. And the professor would come back at this uh, other debater and uh, say, oh, well, you know, that's a nice mystery story or, you know, it's a good literary story, detective story, or, um, you know, this, there's, you're crazy, you know, that that type of response. He was not coming back with facts on his own. I thought, no, gee, there, you know, there seems to be discrepancy here. <laughs> and so um, the uh, the gentleman who was promoting the Earl of Oxford, he had just written a book called The Mysterious William Shakespeare. Mm-hmm. So I got the book out, and I read it, and I was just totally convinced. And when I um, saw how few people there are, really, who are active in this movement, um, I, I decided to join in and do what I can, and uh, that started. I've been into it now for uh, close to thirty years. This mystery, uh, which seems to abide with us, has created a, a firestorm of controversy over the years. I remember encountering this probably back uh, maybe about ten years ago. The concept that perhaps Shakespeare uh, was. <clears throat> Francis Bacon, for instance, um, reasons being largely that um, Bacon being in the court of Queen Elizabeth I and later King, Han- or, I'm sorry, King James, seems to have forged a bit of a footprint in history through um, r- the writings called uh, the New Atlantis, which really pointed us towards uh, something that came a little bit later in history, which was the United States of America as a country, but um, there was all of these all of these rabbit holes that went into the history behind who Shakespeare was, and the lingering doubt that the Bard himself was not who was claimed he was. I just did a horrible transposition of um, grammar there, but um, basically. We're looking at something that goes a bit deeper into history and all the speculation. What have you entertained over the years as possible alternative I- identities to Shakespeare, including the, the concept that perhaps the Shakespeare himself was a composite? Yes. Um, yeah, this is a, a fairly old controversy about, about 150 years ago. In the, in the 1800s, uh, people started questioning, um, you know, who was this man? Um, the main reasons I can tell you was, uh, you know, we, we don't have any evidence of his schooling. We don't have any of his manuscripts. We don't have any authentic image. Um, we don't have um, any evidence of patronage. When he died, there was no notice of his death. Um, his neighbors um, didn't seem to think that he was famous or his children or grandchildren. They never seemed to make any claims that he was a great writer. So, you, you know, you, you get this list of zeros and you, 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 there's a problem here. And so uh, that is when pe- many lawyers, in fact, got into this controversy. Uh, Supreme Court justices, um, the Lord uh, Chief Just- one of the chief justices in England for the law, um, wrote a treatise about this. So, I mean, it, it's, it's something having to do with evidence. And what it boils down to is the Stratford man, who was the traditional Shakespeare, there is no lifetime evidence that he was the great author, William Shakespeare. Um, there is only posthumous evidence, just evidence, of, and that, even that is very light. Uh, so, um, uh, people have considered many different candidates. Most of these candidates were um, people who were highly educated, like Francis Bacon, uh, who had knowledge of the law, um, because whoever the great author was, he had a fantastic law background uh, um, among his other, other, many other topics that he was expert in. And, and so it made sense that Francis Bacon would be a, a main contender. But uh, although he was a towering intellect of his period, he was primarily... Um, 
into the sciences and the natural history. And um, he wasn't really known as a writer. He 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 wrote maybe one or two uh, masks, but but he was not famous as a playwright. Um, and uh, another problem too is there there's so many plays. We have about forty Shakespeare plays, and they they are very very high quality. So you have that um, great amount of work. And you have a very small time frame that the Shakespeare professor or expert has to kind of fit them in. Right, so right. it makes uh, you know, sense that he could have handled that. And so I think that has given rise to the idea that maybe multiple writers, maybe there was a school of writers. Um, and I, I don't really, ex- really buy that. I think there is a, a very common thread, a, a certain voice. And um, if we remove the constraints of the Stratford man's uh, supposed time where he composed, like an approximately 20-year period, if we lift those constraints out and say, look, um, maybe, you know, maybe he wrote much earlier than we thought, you know, then that's when you can start to see a logical pro- progression of when the plays were written. But uh, the professor doesn't want to do that because it would – Kick the Stratford man out of contention. You see, so um, no, no, you're just referring. Want to keep the status quo. <laughs> you're referring to the Stratford man. Um, it almost sounds like an archaeological term right now, and I, I understand it does <laughs> um, very much. And what's interesting about that is that you there is this veil around it. Um, we know, for instance, that um, this is a tourist draw in England, a place called Stratford upon Avon. Um, and we assume that this is the birthplace, but at the same time, uh, do we have birth certificates? Do we have records? Were, were, were people keeping records then? Would it be reasonable to assume there would have been a, a, a legal trail of evidence that would have led us to a conclusion that this, this self-same person existed and that, again, we have some some trail of evidence? As you pointed out earlier, sort of a legal this is a legal trial now. We're trying to establish in, in a court of public opinion uh, the presence of this person and his footprint in history. Yes. Um, uh, when we're speaking of the Stratford man, um, the, the, what we have as far as a paper trail are his, his own christening um, in 1564, um, his children's christenings, a record of his marriage. We have a coat of arms application. We have various lawsuits that have survived. Um, we have lists of him being on lists of that he owes taxes. Um, we have a few lawsuits, like I mentioned, um, and and the the great thing that the professor has in his favor is uh, he is a, a, a theater shareholder. He is on record as owning shares of the Globe Theater. So William Shakespeare is listed. And he was also named um, as one of the actors of the King's Men Acting Company. So during his lifetime, those are the to- only two things that we have as, that are related to theater. Um, but during his lifetime, we don't have any letters. We don't have any manuscripts in his handwriting. We don't have anything. That, it's blank. And that's the problem. Uh, it, it appears that the authorship was bestowed upon him years after he died and years after the real author had died and that's what my book's about now let's go back for a minute because you say there's legal documents um you say there are signatures um what does that tell us about it yeah i think you have an image of that we do we do yes um yes um there are six signatures of the Stratford man. Three appeared on his will, and the other three are from just legal documents that have nothing to do with, you know, literature or um, playwriting or anything. And, and you can see they're very badly formed. Yeah, and uh, the viewers will see that coming up on the screen. Yeah. The, the specimens and that's another the fascinating thing about Shakespeare is um, there's no evidence he went to school. Or university, and um, yeah, there's some of the 
Yeah, so the over here, we well, over there, yeah. it's reverse mirror image. You can see these signature specimens. It's funny, um, and I couldn't find my edition of the works of Shakespeare, but I actually have a pretty old volume of it that has a gold leaf uh, signature on the uh, cover. And you know, the funny thing is, none of these signatures look like the signature that's on the copy of my book right now. I wish I could have found it because it would have been interesting yeah. to, to inspect it. So we have six different signatures. Now, um, have we had an analysis of the signatures? Have we had graphologists look at this? Uh, what can you tell us about the signatures and what they tell well, us? Well, um, yeah, studies have been made about, about them. Um, Actually, in 19, I believe it was 1920, um, someone at the Public Record Office, um, which now they call it the National Archives, where all the where these documents are, um, they, she believed that three of the six were actually forgeries. But I mean, I don't want to go there. The, the point is that these are not very literate signatures. If you look at signatures of other well-known writers of the period and just regular people. Um, they have elaborate, beautiful handwriting, but this is really um, somebody who had a hard time holding a pen. It's very shaky, you could see. And also the the, uh, the spellings are different. So he, he presumably didn't even know how to spell his own name. And that's another interesting thing is um, the name is spelled all sorts of different ways uh, in referencing to the Stratford man in various legal documents and things. It's And it's always pronounced with a, sh a short A, like Shakespeare, S-H-A-C-K, Shakespeare, or S-H-A-X-P-E-R, Shakespeare. It, it was never, it seemed to be pronounced, and you know, they wrote phonetically in these records. Uh, it was never pronounced or sp spelled as we know it, Shakespeare. Um, there may have been one or two instances where it was actually spelled as we know it, but the majority of those references um, emphasize a short A. Um, and if you look at the majority of the printed references to the great author, it's always Shakespeare, S-H-A-K-E, Spear, S-P-E-A-R-E. Um, but another interesting fact, um, if you can bring up uh, the Hamlet title page, uh, you can find that one. Yep, that's on screen now. But again, when you're looking at the image on the, uh, as you're monitoring this, you're in delay. So just remember that it's actually oh, on the screen now. Yeah. So um, this Hamlet title page um, shows you how the name was spelled. Um, yeah, I don't know if you can zoom in on the Shakespeare part, but there is a hyphen between shake and spear in the name. And that was, in, in about half of the time the name appeared in print, it had a hyphen between it. This was emphasizing shake and spear, like spear shaking. Um, and you know they didn't have double names like you know, you know Smith, Mr. Smith Brown. They didn't have those type of compound names like like today they do. So there would be no reason to have a hyphen in there unless we were doing a showing a description. And a lot of character names um, were like made up names like that. Um, so it it's kind of an, an indication right off the bat that this is a pen name, someone's pen name. So this is also an indication that the printers believe the name was a pen name. That's very interesting. So and um, a, 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 a spear shaker, you know, spear shaking was a common expression during that period. What did that to, mean? Yeah, I'm it had to do with um, um, martial, you know, like being in battle like you're shaking your spear at someone, you're threatening them, or it could be like a, you're holding your spear up in victory and you're shaking it, yeah. or, or it could be um, a jouster, which was a sport that was revived during Shakespeare's time where um, these, long, these long spears was the main weapon that jousters would use. So a spear shaker could be a jouster as well. So let's go through um, what other evidence do we have that, that casts doubt upon the singular identity of the bard so far, or the man from Stratford? Well, um, as I mentioned, there's no, nothing in his lifetime record that shows he was in, 
educated or that he was involved in literature at all. We just have those two references that he was involved in, probably in the financial side of the theater by as, a, as a theater shareholder and also possibly as an actor. So he was listed as an actor. So I don't take that away from him. But writing and being, I mean, uh, acting and being a, a shareholder does not mean you're a writer. It's a totally different thing. Um, we have to look at what the contemporaries were writing about Shakespeare. They're writers. And we have printed references. And I have a whole chapter in my book that goes go over these references. Um, and they, in essence, said that Shakespeare was someone who was writing anonymously or with a pen name, that he was uh, well-known to university students, that he was a man of high rank, that he was a generous patron, that he was writing as a, a, as a hobby, as a pastime, not a profession. Um, and all, a few of them said that by praising him would stain his name. So, all you, you know, you add up what contemporaries were actually writing in print about Shakespeare. Of course, we have to. I have to qualify myself and say that they were not totally direct. They they used classical allusions to make their point. And if you were a literate person, you know, at a university level, uh, you would catch these allusions and you would know what was being conveyed. And the whole idea that these allusions were indirect indicates that there was something secret about Shakespeare that they were all adhering to this need for secrecy. One of the points that you seem to make is that, in fact, the Stratford man was illiterate. Uh, what's behind that? He was. I mean, that's what he appears to have been. I mean, with no evidence of letters in his handwriting, no evidence he went to school. Um, we have university records um, of the period, and there's no William Shakespeare on them. And we have the, the background education for many of the writers during this period. And Shakespeare is almost blank, you know. So, um, you know, when you have a man who was proficient in, in the law, um, foreign languages, like uh, ancient Greek, French, Italian, um, botany, I mean, you can just go on and on. Uh, these are things that are not taught at the grade school level, which is what the Shakespeare professor will, will tell you. That he will say that this Strafford man did go to grade school, which is possible. But um, not he did not go to higher education, for sure. Where did he obtain this incredible amount of, of knowledge that Shakespeare had? Uh, the, the professor can't account for it. He'll just say, oh, he picked up French, uh, he was in a tavern, and he picked it up listening to the travelers. You know, that type of thing. They don't have any anything at all to support the Stratford man's case for the authorship, you know, especially uh, uh, for, for and, knowledge. And we're dealing with a body of literature here which in its time was international. It's certainly European in flavor. Um, the settings within the courts of Europe. Um, the courtly manners that have taken place, the dialogues that have taken place, um, they all indicate a knowledge of somebody who would have been traveled or familiar with what went on within the inner chambers of um, the courts of, of Europe at that time, the thrones. So um, <clears throat> how do we how do we winnow through that that little uh, yeah, detail? Yeah, uh, if, if the great author with a Stratford man, it's totally unaccounted for. How did he get access? We don't know. Um, you know, uh, uh, another interesting thing is uh, that his courtly language, the way kings would speak, it it was correct. I mean, there is nothing artificial about it. it he, he was there. He knew about the back workings, I mean, look in Hamlet, what was going on, you know, politically. Uh, he knew about these type of things. How, unless you have exposure to it, how, how are you going to be able to write about it, you know, with full knowledge? Um, uh, for example, um, the great author knew details in Italy. Um, I, I mentioned this to the knave, Mark. Um, the, the, the very opening of Romeo and Juliet is a description of the western gates 
of Verona, and, it, and, and, and sycamore trees are described. Well, this is a very minor detail. It has nothing to do with the Romeo and Juliet story. But if you go to the, today to the Western Gates in Verona, you will see sycamore trees. And, and the plays are filled with re references like that. Italian references that people in Italy have compiled uh, in a great book by Richard Rowe um, details these. He had to have gone to Europe to, to know this knowledge. But there's, you, know, you needed a passport to leave. There's no evidence that Stratford Man left England. And, you know, I mean, there's, there's so many examples like this that, that are unexplainable. Now, if the great author were a nobleman, of course he would know how, what the language of the court was. If the great author you know, was a nobleman, he would have had access to tutors and a university education. Uh, the, he would, could, have, could have taken the grand tour of Europe and would have had the money to do so. Um, we're just, right now, we're describing Nero of Oxford. He did all these things. Let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about um, your candidate here, um, <clears throat> you're, you're saying it's the Earl of Oxford. What, what, give us a little bit of background on him and why you think he fits the profile. Well, just as I mentioned, I mean, he, he, well, first of all, he um, had special tutors very young, and then he went directly to Cambridge. He was eight years old. And then he graduated there, and then he went straight to Oxford. And he, he got a master's. Uh, when he was done at Oxford, at about age 16, he went to law school for a couple of years. And then he, uh, when he was 21, he married the uh, Queen Elizabeth, this is the, the monarch of the time, um, her top minister, Lord Burley. He married her daughter. So he certainly had exposure to the highest levels of government just in his marriage alone. Um, then he, a few years later, he took a grand tour of Europe. He also had a stint in the military, short, but he had exposure. Um, you know, it, the list goes on and on. Um, many of the uh, problems in the Shakespeare plays are explainable if you know the Earl of Oxford's life. And that's why it's so wonderful to learn about the Earl of Oxford because you can read the plays and match it to his life and you, you get so much more out of it because you know the motivation for some of these plays. Um, Hamlet himself is a picture of the Earl of Oxford. Um, he, if you, a brief rundown, I mean, he was a university student like Hamlet. He was a nobleman like Hamlet. He was a courtier like Hamlet. He was a traveler. He was on a ship that was attacked by pirates, same as the Earl of Oxford. Um, he killed somebody. The Earl of Oxford ac supposedly accidentally killed somebody with his uh, rapier. He uh, patronized an acting company. The Earl of Oxford, we know, did at least two acting companies, uh, was, was a patron. Um, and he had a Danish background, the Earl of Oxford. Although he, his family had been in England for 500 years, I mean, his earliest ancestor came in with William the Conqueror. So, I mean, these are just a few things, but the most important thing of all is that Earl of Oxford was known to have be a, a playwright. He was named as best in comedy, and he was also known to have written anonymously. And none of the plays that he wrote have his name on it. So what were those plays? So, um, yeah, he had an incredible life. Do we just know him as the Earl of Oxford? Do we have, uh, you know, first and last name? Do we? Yeah, his name, um, Edward de Vere. Okay. The 17th Earl of Oxford. And can you line up the timelines with the Earl's um, time, his lifetime uh, with the Shakespearean uh, writings, the history of what we believe is a time when, when the Bard would have written? Um, yes. Uh, that's a point that they always uh, try and, the, the uh, Shakespeare experts try and, you know, 
put us down when they say, oh, well, the Earl of Oxford died in 1604, therefore, you know, the plays were written several after that. That is totally not true. There is absolutely no evidence of when any of the plays were performed. They, if you look at any dating of a Shakespeare play in, a, in an Orthodox book, it'll, there'll be a question mark after it. They do not know. And I, in, in the appendix of my book, Shakespeare Suppressed, I make a list of 93 allusions to phrases um, or unusual word clusters that appear in other people's works. And, you know, we, the dating goes as early as 1562, which is about 30 years earlier than what the professor w believes is when the great author was writing. Mm -hmm. So the dating is totally off. Um, and he, his trying to fit 40 wonderful plays in, in a maybe a 22-year period or so is just it's it's not logical. And, yeah, that's um, that's prolific, um, and yes, that's actually yes. beyond human pro prolific. I don't, yes, I don't. like for example, Christopher Marlowe, he wrote um, about seven plays in a, in about a seven-year period. So uh, that. Again, his dating is not exact, but he only lived to be about 33, I think, 32 or 33. Now, so, there, are um, some, there are some details um, that indicate Shakespeare's intimate knowledge of certain things within the court, one of which uh, I believe we talked about shows up in uh, the Sonnet 125. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? And what I'll do is I'll throw that up on the screen. Sure, yeah, that's a great this one. This is pretty interesting, actually. Um, yes. Um, well, the line that I'm going to quote is from Shakespeare's sonnets. And the sonnets of Shakespeare, there's about um, 154, um, they were the great author's personal writings, his personal ruminations about things and people, people who he loved, and his incidences that were important to him. And in one of them, and at 125, he said this line, were it aught to me, I bore the canopy with my extern, the outward honoring? Okay, so what is that referred to? Yes, there you go. Um, that refers... There's only one thing it could refer to. Queen Elizabeth, when she would be out in public events, often would have a canopy over her head as she's moving. Um, usually she was in a chair or on a chariot or something like that. And uh, four people would hold the canopy over her head. They were like four poles. And, yes, here's, uh, here's a partial yeah, unfortunately, the graphics are getting cut yeah. off. The screen yeah, you can so. see on the far right, you can see the poles of two of them. Yeah. And the people who would have the privilege of holding the canopy over the queen would be some high official or a courtier or a nobleman, pretty much. And um, here Shakespeare is saying, was it anything to me that I bought the canopy? Like, did it mean anything to me? <laughs> in essence, is what he's saying. And, well, if the great author were the Stratford man, the humbly born Stratford man, that would be the high point of his life to be able to do something like that. Um, it would be noted, and people would note it. History would have noted it. Um, it is not the profile. He, he does not fit the profile of the man who would hold the canopy over the queen. Um, and, and also in the sonnets, the great author tells us he's highly ranked ranked um, in one line in, in line six uh, sonnet 62 he says methinks no face so gracious is is mine as mine and gracious thinking his face is gracious great gracious was a term that shakespeare used only to describe the no, nobility or the royalty so here he's saying that his he's describing his own face as gracious you know um there, there's many other examples. Of course, his knowledge of the aristocracy is very detailed. He knew their sports, like falconry. He knew intimate terms. He knew tennis. I mean, they didn't have public tennis courts back then, <laughs> you know. Um, another interesting point for the Earl of Oxford is that he was a jouster. He 
he won two tournaments. Uh, so he could certainly call himself a spear, a spear shaker. In Absolutely. fact, I was just looking into it, and most yeah. of the jousting tournaments were before the queen, and were they they were um, you know they were a, a public spectacle um, in front of royalty. So you had to have been somewhat special to be able to be a jouster in, in, in most of the cases. So it's another indication that he was using a pen name, you know. So in all of this, um, we get the picture that the man from Stratford, as he's so called and as it's been portrayed, has become, I guess, kind of a cottage industry in the modern times um, because the reputations of professors uh, the reputations and the industry behind this uh, uh, whole milieu of uh, Stratford upon Avon is 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 in now enshrined. It's it's almost like we've we've we have a mythology here, and yeah. the mythology itself has fed an entire industry, and that industry is not only just um, the tourist industry that, that, that builds around this, but uh, the industry of intellectual studies at universities. I mean, I, you know, people, I remember being in, 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 take, in school and taking literary courses, and, you know, some of us endured Shakespeare more gracefully than others. Um, I actually mm -hmm. enjoyed some of it. Some of it, you know, seemed a little archaic for the times that I grew up in. But uh, the fact is that we were taught these things as facts, and this goes into the whole purpose of doing the type of work that you're doing, because it is an alternative historical uh, uh, pursuit in basically exploding the myths around it. What kind of blowback do you get from people over kind of, uh, well, deconstructing the mythology? Well, I'm very little, um, you know, I am not an academic, so I guess, you know, it's better to just ignore people like me. You know, I'm a quote-unquote amateur. That's the, you know, one of the phrases they hurl at us, you know. Um, you're not qualified to have an opinion, they would tell you, you know, often. Um, well, you know, I did a history book. I wrote, and I have 600 footnotes, and it's a research book. It's not a, you know, it's not a novel, and I think that they should look at their own evidence. Uh, they seem to have a, this bar in front of them that they can't seem to understand the concept that there were two William Shakespeare's during this period. One was a man born with the name William Shakespeare, or Shakespeare, as, as the record would show, and the other one was someone who was using a pen name, and they were both involved in the theater. But one was the writer, and one was someone who, who got into it, you know, in the, in the financial end and, and possibly the acting end, although there's no evidence that he was an actor during his lifetime. So um, to me, it's an easy concept because, for example, there were two poets during the same period who lived the same lives, you know, almost the same time period, and both were named John Davies. And to this day, uh, the scholars still are not sure, you know, which John Davies it was that wrote on so poem. So uh, there were others William Shakespeare's, actually. I found a William Shakespeare uh, listed in the same county as the Stratford man, which is Warwickshire. And he, in 1605, he was a soldier. And his name was William Shakespeare. So there were other people named William. It was not that unusual a name. And um, we, we just have to look at the works. What do the works and what do the sonnets tell us about the great author? We have to listen to what he was telling us. What is the profile of the man who wrote these works? It, you know, we can't be blinded by their main evidence, which is the, the Shakespeare's first folio, which I do have an image, if you want to throw that up. Um, that they're very famous. That's coming up on the screen. Black and white of William Shakespeare, yeah. I mean, that book is primarily the reason why um, the world believes the great author was the Stratford man. Um, oh, this is the monument. Yes. Yeah, that's, um, can we, that's inside the folio. Maybe we should get the front page with the image, black and white image. Of... Again, yeah, unfortunately, these things come up, but uh, you're in delay, so. Um... Oh, I see. Is the image up? Yes, I have it up. I think I have it up now. Um, it should be coming up on the screen here. 
This isn't yeah. quite as instantaneous as doing a PowerPoint. So, right, right. Because we're dealing with um, Well, I mean, it's the title page to, they call it today the first folio. Folio means the large page size, um, very large page size. And um, yeah, there were 36, the I'm sorry? No, no, the, 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 I'm going by how the, t the slides are titled here, so. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, we need the first folio. Opening page? Yeah. Okay, that's what I thought we had put up. Oh, there it is, okay. That's coming up on the screen now. Oh, wonderful. And people will recognize this image. This is yeah. actually, this actually is kind of the iconic Shakespearean image yeah. uh, that we that we tend to associate with, with uh, the bard. Yes, there it is. This is the title page, front, front two pages of the first folio. And that is a book that was printed in 1623. That was seven years after the Stratford man had died. And it, this book contained 36 Shakespeare plays. Uh, if this book had never been printed, we never would have had 20 Shakespeare plays. I mean, this is an incredibly important book. It was the, it's the greatest event in English literature was the publication of this book. And um, this is the front page. And for the first time, we see an image of the great author, supposedly. And um, it's, it, this image has been criticized over the years for being very badly rendered. Um, I don't think it's detailed enough to show you, but some people actually think that it's a mask um, because under the ear are two lines. So it's almost you know, actually like, you know, when you look at this, and even as it's rendering yeah. on to our video screen, it kind of does look like a mask. If you look at the uh, the left side profile, there's a delineation between the face and the hairline that goes the whole way down around the chin. If you look at yeah. it, yeah, but it almost yeah. does look like a mask. Yeah. Maybe uh, I don't know if masks come with enough detail to have that mustache yeah. there. Yeah, but, yeah. yeah but I'm, I'm, I'm not claiming it is, but it could be seen that way. And um, but the the point is, is it this book? If we if you had shown us another page of text, which was um, had two poems on it. On one poem is the term Stratford Monument. And then on another page is another poem written by a well-known playwright, Ben Johnson, and he used the phrase regarding Shakespeare, sweet swan of Avon. So you have Avon on one page and Stratford Monument on another page, and that is the reason why we associate uh, the great author with Stratford upon Avon, is because those two different poems in this book. Um, but... There were many Stratfords during this period. There are at least 16 uh, cities that had Stratford in it. So how do we know it's Stratford on Avon? The, the phrase Stratford on Avon was not even um, in this book. Now, where would the Earl have been living? He would have been on an estate somewhere. Do we? He have... was living. Yeah, uh, he was living um, in the suburbs of London. Then, and then, what were the suburbs um, today? It's called. It's still called Hackney. Um, he had an estate there, and of course, it's gone now. And relative to that, where would the uh, the, the famous Globe Theatre have been? Um, yeah, that was on the other side of the Thames. So yeah, I mean, um, but the Earl of Oxford did live near. One of his homes was near um, uh, the Blackfriars Theatre, but. Anyway, that's a little bit off topic, but okay. um, but his his involvement in the theater was well known, um, as I mentioned. Um, but the reason um, why we associate the Stratford man was because of this book, and because of those two terms, Stratford on one page, Avon on the other, and then there is a, stra a monument to Shakespeare in Stratford on Avon, and that those were those images of the mountain um, monuments that you had brought up. Yeah, and uh, the point of those two different images of the monument was to show you how the monument had changed. And again, it's something that the Orthodox Shakespeareans are in denial that there was a change. Um, the original 
documentary evidence shows that the monument to Shakespeare was a man holding a sack. Um, but today's monument is a man holding a pen. <laughs> Yeah, yeah well, we're actually got. I reversed the order on these, so you saw the yeah. contemporaneous image first. But what's coming up on the screen next is actually the earlier image, which looks like an engraving. And, yes, um, it's a little difficult. First... Difficult to tell the details there. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. So, um, looking at the engraving, um, you can see a man is holding a sack. You don't see any pen and paper. Now, what does that? No, what does? How did we get from there to there? Uh, that's that's an interesting <laughs> transition. We have an image. You know, the other thing is, Catherine, um, we have we have images of great people, and most of them are highly stylized. And I always refer back to this, but I, I live near Philadelphia, and in Philadelphia there is a statue of uh, Benjamin Franklin. And people have remarked on this over the years about the fact that Franklin appears in this particular statue with uh, a Roman uh, garb, a laurel and, and, and a robe that would indicate yeah. that he had some pretense to the Roman legislator that I think he idealized he was. Um, these were stylized images, obviously intended to present a context for the person, but with, sh with 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 Shakespeare, we don't really see that. Uh, it's a little bit better in the second image. This first image, I, I would have never even guessed this was Shakespeare. I would have just. Uh... <laughs> well, Randy, you made an excellent point that you know during this period, and, and up until the 1700s, uh, people of merit who who did had literary merit were often portrayed as Roman in the Roman style with laurel leaves on their head. Yes, And exactly. Ben Jonson, who was a well-known playwright during this period, also was portrayed this way. But Shakespeare never was. <laughs> in fact, there's no mention of even, um, you know, him being a, a famous writer on this monument. So um, the monument has changed. It's clearly, if you can see, if you go back and forth, it's changed. And um, it's, he, he it was made to look like a writer, whereas before it was a man holding a sack. And uh, a fascinating point is on the column. Like you can see there's two columns. Um, the column now is like a Corinthian a Corinthian at the top. Yeah, yeah, it but, is, actually. Yeah. But in the first image, the engraving, it's uh, a leopard head. And that was the, the um, symbol of Stratford-upon-Avon. So if you were involved in the management of Stratford-upon-Avon as a, you know, a bailiff or an alderman or something like that, you could rightly have that type of image on your monument. But uh, the Stratford man was, was not involved at all, but his father was. And that's the point. This more than likely is... Uh, his father's monument that was later changed into the son's monument. So he was basically the son of a farmer. He was the son of of, of a wool dealer um, or glover. Interesting, so, um, interesting yeah. stuff. You know, so we come to the conclusion here, Catherine, and you know, I don't want you to give everything away because I think I think this is a read worthwhile for the listeners in terms of. Um, investigating the matter for themselves but what can we take away from this in terms of the identity of the man of of this anthropological figure we call the man from Stratford we know as the bard we know as William Shakespeare uh, what at the end of the day is the conclusion the conclusion is the great the greatest author of the English language was Edward de Beers 17th Earl of Oxford a nobleman um, and his life story is reflected in every one of the plays and the sonnets. And um, if you really love Shakespeare, and, and that's really the reason why I wrote this book, people who love Shakespeare are going to love him so much more when they know more about him. The, the life he endured, what he, you know, the he went through a lot of tragedies and scandals in his lifetime. And he went to jail. <laughs> he was in the tower. Um, you're just going to love him so much more. 
Uh, my book does not get into his life story. It, it, it just pretty much focuses on the Stratford man. Um, but um, there's lots of good books about the Earl of Oxford, one by Mark Anderson. Um, I would also encourage listeners to go to the Doubt About Will dot org website and you can see a list of all the very highly um, lettered people who believe that there is a problem with the Stratford man as a great author and um, very good we're running out of time on this segment I'm sorry because you got a little bit short and this was an interesting subject much more than we could have handled in an hour Catherine. yes but yes. it is still a fascinating study the book is called Shakespeare Suppress the website is shakespearesuppressed.com and we want to thank our guest Catherine Children for joining us for this first hour tonight and examining a fascinating subject that I think is more important than many people have given credence to. Catherine, thank you so much for coming on and um, <clears throat> we're going to take a break we will be back in about uh, seven or eight minutes probably our next guest up, Gloria Amendola will be talking about Mary Magdalene the first century avatar and uh, we'll take a break and come back on the, the other side of Off Planet TV on this Alternative History series, Ladies of Alternative Histories tonight. We'll be back in about five to six minutes.